All right. How are you? Good. How you doing, Andy? I'm hanging in there. I had a weird couple of hours, but I'm okay. I'm good. I'm good. Oh, uh, great, great. Thanks for doing this. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, I'm honored. I'm truly honored to have you here. Um, I was telling my team, oh my, oh my God, like when we first wanted to do this, oh my God, is he going to do this? You don't think I was weird or anything like that? But no, no, I'm, I'm thankful that you're here. Thank you so much. Oh, this is great. Thanks. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, we have quite a few people in the room. So ladies and gentlemen, this is Tony Trujillo. Am I, am I pronouncing your name right, by that's the way? It. That's right, Trujillo. Yeah. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, he is a professor at um, Columbia College of Chicago. He has 12 books that are out. And what we're going to do is we're going to be talking about Elise Cohen. We're going to talk about the Beast Generation. We're going to talk about his works as well. And we're going to have fun with this. So, um, for those who don't know who you are, I guess if you want, you can start. We'll start with, you know, tell me a little bit, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself more, to be more expansive, I guess, if that makes sense. Yeah, sure. Um, as, as Andy was saying, I teach at Columbia College, Chicago. Um, I've lived in Chicago for about over, a little over 20 years. And uh, um, I'm a poet and a scholar and a musician. And uh, uh, my poems tend to be, you know, influenced by, a lot by the New York School poets and uh, by, by uh, you know, some of what the Beat Generation was doing also. And uh, uh, I have a big soft spot in my heart for William Blake, uh, and uh, as a scholar, wow. most of, yeah, he's one of my favorites. Yeah, uh, and as a scholar, most of what I research has been uh, Beat Generation literature, Beat Generation poetry. Um, so it's really cool that you've, you know, uh, we're, we're 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 working with both tonight. Um, right, right. And that's yeah, that's probably about all. You know, I, I live in the north side of Chicago by Lake Michigan, and. And uh, man, it's been a tough weekend for all of us. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh my God. But how is it over there? Like, has it been crazy on your end too, where you're at, or, or is it a little bit more controlled? No, it's been um, it's been pretty uh, pretty intense here. Um, my neighborhood. There's been demonstrations. We're we're a pretty politically active neighborhood, and uh, it's on the oh. it's called Rogers Park. Uh, really, really good. I love. It's a real community, and. Uh, uh, but man, what's been going on in downtown Chicago, the loop, the photos I've seen, the city is burning. Uh, we have a curfew. Um, it's six wow. o'clock here. So like when we end tonight at eight, I go out for my walk and I'm going to get in just before the curfew. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Just what we're oh, living man. With now, you know? And, yeah. And Even then, New York was even New York was crazy too, actually. Um, I mean, I live in New Jersey, but I'm okay. originally from New York and it's just the stuff I've been seeing, it's just it's just very ridiculous. And you know what, like, yeah, I just, I guess just hope and believe that, you know, we're gonna be okay at the end. It's just, it's unfortunate how things just turn up, you know? I know, it's the thing, like I even, even like talking about the curfew tonight, one of the reasons I mentioned it is so I don't forget. Like I'm not used to living under curfew. And I have to remember, like, okay, you know, things shut down at nine. Right. But you know, this is I, I I agree with you. Like, we just have to hope we can get through it. And I'm really glad that people. Um, I'm really glad that people are active. You know, I mean, yeah. that, that they're you know they're remembering George Floyd and everybody who's been who's victimized by police brutality and and speaking yeah. out. People gotta. People got, you know, we have to do our, whatever our part is, as long as we're doing our part, I'm glad we can do that. Right. Yeah. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, it's interesting you say that because now that, now we could, we're going to get right into it, the sure. beat generation, you know, it seems like that's exactly what they were trying to do too, through writing as well, you know, and um, I want to, you know, point out some things that, you know, caught my eye as I was doing the research, you know, I know. The focal point of that generation was the rejection of standards, which is the society, the spirit, uh, making a spiritual quest, rejection of exploration of religion and economic materialism, explicit portrayals of human condition. You know, we were just talking about that, you know, experimenting with drugs and marijuana, LSD. And Allen Ginsberg was definitely one of those core figures in forming that beat generation. So, you know, with that being said, um, my first question is when all of this took place because from and correct me if I'm wrong. I believe this is from like after World War II. Am I correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that was a very interesting time because um, I guess well, my question, my, I guess. Uh, so my first question is, what was a factor 
that allowed this moment to form? Like, what was it that happened that said, okay, we're going to do this? Like, what was that? That's a great question. Like, what was like, what was uh, what was the button that got pushed? That kind of question. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, I mean, I think there's so much that was going on, but I think like to try to try to put it in a nutshell, like I think a lot of it had to do. I'm not just saying this because I'm an educator, but I think a lot of it had to do with education. I mean, you had a lot of folks who were. Um, this was after World War II, after the GI Bill. You had a lot of folks who. Um, were able to go to college who couldn't afford it before. And they were getting turned on to a lot of great literature, but they were noticing, I think, that they were getting turned on to a literature that wasn't speaking to their moment. You know, it was speaking to the past. Mm. And um, the beat writers, I think, were the ones who who were, you know, they were they were like on the on the forefront. They were at the vanguard of just saying, like, you know, this the world looks the world after World War II, it looks really peaceful, but um, there's still you know, racism and sexism and classism. And then there's the nuclear bomb that could destroy us in, or the, the, at the time, I guess the atomic bomb that could destroy us in a second. And I think that, you know, they were in different ways. I think they were able to focus on like, okay, it's great that we're living in peaceful times after World War II, but America is still a colonial power and that's not cool. And, and uh, it's going to, uh, um, it's going to bring a lot of suffering into the world. And I, I think, wow. I think it was just, that moment where things were peaceful enough for people to hear it. Well, it wasn't all peaceful, but I mean, there was no, World War right, II was right. over and people were exhaling. But I also think there were just a lot of people who were able to go to college and like take a lot of um, courses in the humanities and just sort of like, see, it was feeding something in them that they weren't, you know, a lot of people, it, it, weren't, it wasn't open, college hadn't been open to people. It was feeding something, but I think they realized Wow, it's feeding something in me, but there's something missing, and the beat writers right. provided what was what was missing. That's that's my effort to sort of. I mean, there are probably a, a bunch of other ways to say that, but that's right. one path in, I think. Yeah. Okay. No, that's that's powerful. That's definitely powerful indeed. And I think that, and it's just that I think uh, the way from what you told me, the way I understood that from what you're saying basically it looked like america was sugar coating they were masking <laughs> some things trying to hide some things where we don't get exposed but it seemed like the beat generation writers eventually said no we're going to expose this and we're going to do it through our work we're going to do it how you know the way we're going to do it but without the craziness but it, it, you know there's so many scope of things that took place with that so um it's interesting you said that because this actually leads to uh, another question. So everyone that was part of the Beach Generation, do you believe they were declaring change and or they were they predicting the future? Meaning like change as in, okay, if it, we don't want no more of this, let us be ourselves. Or do you mean, pre or, and or was it prediction as in, if this does not stop, it's going to get worse. And if you stop listening to, you need to start listening to what we're saying. Otherwise, it's going to get crazy from here. And I wonder, you know, with everything that's going on now with the George Floyd, it just makes you wonder now, like, were they predicting? Like, was this, like, were they predicting already what's going to continue getting worse if they didn't stop? Do you think it was either or do you think it was both? I, I think it was both. I think that's right on what you're saying. I think it was both. Like, I think there was... There was this real effort among the beat writers, the 1950s, the 1960s, 1970s, you know, to say like, here's, here's the big, here's a big gaping wound in America that no one wants to pay attention to, and we're gonna ask you to pay attention to it in our writing because maybe we can build a better world from it. Yes. And I, and I, but I think also, like you said, there was also kind of a warning, like, like if we don't. Um, we could be doomed, you know, and I, I think that like Gins, Allen Ginsberg, for instance, one of his um, one of his most powerful books for me right now is called The Fall of America. And it was from the mid 1960s. And when I was, you know, several years ago when I read it, the fall of America sounded like a metaphor. And now the kind right. of world we're living in now, I'm like, wait a minute. He meant it really. He meant like if we don't like you were saying, if we don't do certain things, America's going to fall. And I think he'd be looking at what's happening now and um, uh, weeping and also thinking like, oh, man, this is this is what I was afraid of. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, so like, so like, with that being said, like if Allen Ginsberg was alive today, what do you think he would say right now if he was alive right now in this moment? 
seeing all this. Yeah, I think he would do, I think he'd be writing poems about it. And I think he'd be going to demonstrations and writing about the demonstrations. I also think, and this was, he had, this was some of the things as a, Ginsburg as a public figure that really inspired me. He inspires me as a poet too. But one of the things okay. he did as a public figure that really is like, he just knew how to listen to, um, listen to other activists and artists. And as he got older, that meant listening to the younger generation and just, and just saying like, okay, you're, you're, you're like, he would like say if he was 60 years old, he'd be like, okay, you're 30. You've grown up in a different America than me. Tell me what it's like. And I'm going to listen. And I think that's why he would, you know, in the seventies and the eighties, he was teaming up with punk rock musicians when, when punk rock was so weird to people and so bizarre yeah. to people. And, <laughs> and I think it was probably kind of weird to him, but he recognized there was an activist impulse and that it was youth culture. And I think he recognized, man, I got to listen to what, to what the, the younger folks are saying. And I, I think he'd be, right, right. he'd have poems to write, but I think he'd be listening too. Right, right. No, absolutely with that. Um, because when you talk about punk rock, I also think about the LA punk scene. Oh man, in Los yeah. Angeles. Because that was a crazy time. And I, I've seen that documentary, um, Decline of Western the Civilization. Decline of Western, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. But that was such oh my god, that's such an eye opener for me because it just gives me a whole different perspective of wow, you know what? There was a lot of these people who went through worse than I did. And it's like, wow. You yeah. know, it's it's crazy. But it wasn't just okay, they were homies, they were doing drugs, they were listening to No, it was like a movement, you know? It was a movement, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Mm. Oh and my they... goodness. No, this is exciting. <laughs> oh, this is great. I love, I right. love that we we've started talking about the beats and now we're talking about punk rock. Let's go for it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So it is funny because this first piece I'm actually gonna read, um, it links up to everything you just said. Um so this is from Brian.Edwards.Live. So everyone knows him as Brian Edwards. Um, he's a very big um, inspiration to everyone in the poetry community. Um, he's very real, um, down to earth, but like he tells it how it is. And he's very like, he like like Allen Ginsberg, he wants to see what else goes on. Okay, I'm older, you're younger, but I want to so see what it is. I want to lift you up too, you know, when it comes to the poetry community. So it's just... Um, I have an honor and privilege in um, getting to know this guy right here. So um, there's no title to this piece. So I'm going to read this um, a little bit kind of long, but you know, it is what it is. Um, all right. Let me just pull this up here and then we'll get right to it. All right. So it goes like this. It mattered to him since where it was that he came from. Justice came with a bloody blade cutting off your hands if you got caught stealing. Children must be taught a lesson, even if they're starving. Then when you're older, judgment comes swifter as heads are severed as a warning in the middle of the East for all the people to witness. It would have mattered to her as the headlines read how she dishonored her family by posting a picture of her with her fiance a day before their wedding. Her death, her death, I'm sorry, wait, her death certificate said suicide stating she jumped out of a window, yet nothing was ever mentioned how her body was covered in bruises because, so they say, honor killings don't exist anymore. It mattered to his family when they scorched up the money so he could move to the States from Nigeria. Now it's his turn to bring his brothers and sisters here to America, knowing that, knowing they may never see their mother again she said that their lives are more important than hers. Yet every day he catches shade in the hood for the color of his skin because they say that he's not black enough to live here. It matters to those who snuck across the border from South America to provide a better life for their children because it's safer to watch the violence on TV rather than living it in person every time they step outside their front door in the country they ran away from where the cartels outgunned the local government. It matters to him that his elderly parents have actually, I'm sorry, have an actual ceiling above their heads because in their country, you were considered lucky if the roof you slept below was stolen from a dumpster or a construction site at night after you paid off the security guard to look the other way. As a mother, it mattered to her when she was on a missionary trip to a third world country 
and she saw a small child running bare naked down the street. If she left the group to go save him, she might get kidnapped, beaten, raped, and murdered just so a young man can prove his loyalty to a gang, just so he can feed his family. If the world was blind, no one would mind because everyone looks the same. If the world was deaf, no sound would be left to hear the voices place the blame. It's like what Mother Teresa said one day, I would never attend an anti-war rally. If you have a peace rally, invite me. She didn't care about color, where you were born or what religion you were raised because to her, all lives matter. Mm. Mm. That's great. Wow. Yeah, yeah, thank you. No, you're welcome. And that was by Brian Edwards. And um, I, I feel like that piece alone just confirms what we were already talking about, you know? And, and I think what it is too with that generation, the Beast generation to relate to it, it seemed like before that time, they were conditioned to live a certain way. And then it's like, okay, now that you're growing up, you're seeing things from a different scope. It's kind of like, no, 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 you're not allowed to see that, no. And, and, and that was wrong at that time. Because I guess like at that time frame, Everybody lived a conservative way. Everybody lived a certain way. And I'll say this on my life. Um, you know, I, I come from a Hispanic cultural background. So anyone from that time frame, that Hispanics, um, you know, we were conditioned to be a certain way because like, like, like if I try to explain to my parents about the stuff we talk about today, they wouldn't understand that. It was like, you know, our emotions were not allowed. We weren't allowed to be a certain way, talk a certain way or walk a certain way we had to be whatever they say that was it and it's just little did they realize later that okay but if we you know now that we, we didn't mean to second guess what they're saying but we were questioning because okay but maybe this is not right anymore mm -hmm. if that makes sense mm -hmm. it was right at one time but it might not be right anymore yeah yeah right right absolutely yeah. absolutely yeah uh, all right, no, so um, I guess if you want to read a piece now on your end, and then we can take it from there as well. Sure. Um, should I, I'm trying to remember the order. Should I read read from Elise Cowan's work or my work at this point? I can't remember. No, it's up to you. No, no, it's up to you. Whatever is, you know, whatever is organic to you. Okay, okay. Uh, well, you know, since we're talking about the beats right now, I'll start with uh, uh, a poem from Elise Cowan. Um, okay. And it's one of her shorter poems. and. Um, maybe I should say a little bit about Elise's, her life first, maybe, or, or is that okay? Or? Yeah, okay, yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, go ahead, yeah, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead, did you want to, yeah, go ahead, yeah. Yeah, no, no, I'll just say, um, um, one thing I, I did just some, re when I was doing some research about Elise Cowan, um, there's not a lot about her, and uh, one thing I noticed, too, she was very overshadowed, like she was overlooked. Yeah. Now, my question is, was she overlooked by Allen Ginsberg? Oh, she was just overlooked as an overall in general because of the short life that she lived. Because, um, yeah, because unfortunately, um, you know, she committed suicide yeah. Yeah. You know, due to the depression stuff she went through. So I feel like we would never get the chance to see exactly all the stuff that she was talking about. Because one thing I noticed, she did go through like some mental health issues. Yeah. She did struggle with identity. And I think it goes back to what I was saying about my parents, you know, like we grew up in this whole being conditioned to be a certain way because of the culture we come from. Exactly. And it seems like with her, it was like that too. Um, one thing I learned about her was that she was comes from a Jewish background. Yes. So, you know, how it was with them, you know, and I live in, a, I used to live in an area where there's a lot of Jewish people too, and they're a certain way. So they isolate themselves away from people like you and me. And then, yeah, that's just how it is. And Elisa's family, um, she grew up in Washington Heights, New York. Yeah. Um, she was born in 1933. And as you were saying, she came from a, 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 a she was uh, from a Jewish family. And, you know, there was a particular, I think her family had a very particular conservative, uh, I shouldn't say conservative, but, you know, a very, a particular, very limiting way that they wanted their daughter to be. They wanted a particular daughter who was a particular way, particularly traditional in a way that like, what you know, like in your family might be, you know, what would, what would be a Hispanic traditional womanhood. And for my family, a traditional Italian womanhood. And for her family, like a traditional Jewish girl. And, and that meant, you know, someone who would, who would assimilate into the larger culture, who would, who would, you know, have a, 
you know, be married and have 2.5 kids and, and uh, two cars right. in the garage in the suburbs. And she wanted to be an artist. And it didn't fit, they didn't fit those categories at all. And, and growing up in the 1950s for her, there were so few opportunities to be an innovative avant-garde female artist. And she was innovative, she was avant-garde, she was a woman, and that kind of made her scary and dangerous to people. And so, right, right. like when you asked was she overlooked um, by Allen Ginsberg, yes, sadly, I and mean, I love Ginsberg's work and he's a very inspiring writer for me, but I do, and he was a very politically active person, like we were saying, but he had his own limitations. We all have our limitations. And one of his limitations was with women. He just, he'd be in a room and he would see men, but he wouldn't really see the women. They weren't as visible to him. There was, so there was, that was his particular, you know, we have all of our isms baked into us and his particular form of sexism was he just saw men before he saw women. And right. she, they dated for a very short time during this period where Ginsburg was experimenting with heterosexuality and um, eventually their dating didn't work out romantically and they stayed friends. Um, and the problem was that I think he, you know, he did overlook her, I think, as a writer. And I think he, he was probably very, from what I've been able to gather in my research, he cared for her as a friend, but he also was kind of complacent about their friendship. And I think their friendship meant more to her than it meant to him, even though he was mm. her friend. Um, but it's sad because he was a, he was a poet who was really good about promoting the work of other poets. He was almost like, right. he was almost like the literary agent for the beat generation. And he probably could have drawn out Elise's poems more and promoted them more, but right, right. I think he overlooked her as a writer. And then her response was, well, I'm not gonna show him my poems then. You know, I'm gonna keep them to myself. And mm. so it was this terrible cycle where she was writing great poems and she was in a progressive left-wing community but they weren't progressive enough to not be sexist. And so she was writing great poems, but because she was a woman, even her fellow artists weren't hearing her the way they should have. Yeah. Damn. It's kind of a long wow. answer to your question, but yeah. Right. No, no, no. I definitely understand that. Um, I know when, because I know he struggled a lot with his sexual, his, his homosexuality, Ginsburg did. Early on, and, yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. And then here's the part I'm confused about. Sure. So. Because there was a part that I saw where she was, um, like she she ended up getting pregnant and it had the abortion. I was Allen Ginsberg was the one that got her pregnant. Uh, got her pregnant. This thing I don't understand. I'm a little confused about that. No, he he was not. Um, there was uh, um, so much of her history is is uh, sadly is mysterious because there was just um, she she was overlooked so much in life that there's a lot we still don't know and. When I talk to other researchers, we often try to say like, we'll patch together like, what happened during that period when she was in Berkeley? What happened when she was in, uh, right. uh, what happened when she was in upstate New York and things like that? And so she, um, uh, she, she tried to get the abortion in when she was on the West Coast. And um, I think it was, from what we can gather, probably the Bay Area, although I've talked with other researchers who said maybe it was Los Angeles. Um, it was shrouded in mystery, um, except what was not mysterious was they, um, the, the doctors performed a, a hysterectomy on her. And so it was, it was like medical brutality, you know, and, and, and in a period where wow. abortion rights didn't exist where it was, you know, it was, it was, uh, uh, like it was back, forbidden basically. Yeah. Uh, back alley underground and really dangerous and really, really dangerous. And so, um, but yeah, that's the, I mean, that's the thing like to your question about her trying to get an abortion. It's a really important question to who she is as a person, but like a lot of things I found out when I was doing, I, I edited this book of her poems, Elise Cowan poems and fragments that I'll be reading from. And when I was doing research on her life, um, it, it took a long time to do the book because there's just, it's really hard to get the facts. There's a lot of misinformation and a lot of blank spots, sadly. Yeah. Right. Right. Wow. No, that's wow. Like, you know, it just gets you speechless, you know, and it's just yeah, like, wow, know. you know, and it sucks, you know? Um, I know one thing I, I found interesting about her too, was that when he finally 
Um, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced his name, Peter Orlovsky. Am I pronouncing uh, that right? Orlovsky, Orlovsky, yeah. Oh, Orlovsky, you know, when he eventually became partners with her, she tried to impress him with her partner. Now, was it with um, someone named Sheila, if I'm not mistaken? Sheila, yeah, yeah. But yeah. even with that, like you said, it looks like even that, it was like, okay, cool, whatever. But like, he went about his business regardless of like, what 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 Elise Cohen was trying to do to impress Allen Ginsberg a lot as well. Yeah, there was uh, in terms of the relationship between Elise Cowan and Allen Ginsberg. I think that you know he was just going along with his life. They were friends and they looked out for each other when they could. And right. and Elise was um, really close with the Orlovsky family. Um, but it was you know Ginsberg met Peter Orlovsky right when he and Elise right right around the time that they stopped being romantic. And right. he fell in love with Peter and they became life partners. And so wow. Elise and Alan and Peter were close. And then when Elise met Sheila, Elise and Sheila and Alan and Peter, you know, there was there was an effort to, um, you know, I think they, they were all friendly. They were acquaintances and, okay. and, and yeah, good friends, part of a community. Yeah. Right, right. No, that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. I don't know. So if you want to like read, I guess, a piece now from you know, Lise. Sure, sure. And this is a, um, this is a shorter poem. Um, you know, when I, when I was putting the book together, I tried to look at like themes and patterns in her poems, poems to try to figure out how to organize them in the book. And one of the most powerful themes, and you, you know, you mentioned that she was brought up in a Jewish household. One of her most powerful themes is her effort to work against traditional patriarchal religious systems. So, um, you know, she was Jewish, but she was also interested in, in uh, Tibetan Buddhism, and she was always trying to find ways to mix together different kinds of religious traditions and really to talk back to the uh, patriarchs of, of our wow. religions. And um, this is one of those poems that talks back nicely. Um, um, oh, and I can, I can cuss, right? Yeah, yeah, no, no, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, we all, we always, <laughs> yeah, we, yeah. yeah. Okay. So I can I don't have to, I don't have to censor Elise Cowan. I'm very happy. Okay. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. This is all down and dirty, raw, straight to the point. That's cool. all it is. You I, curse I just, whatever you want. I didn't want to be a, I didn't want to be a bad guest, you know. So uh, no, uh, no, no, no. It's all good. <laughs> so this poem is called um, "Dear God of the Bent Trees of Fifth Avenue." Okay. Dear God, and so Elise Cowan. Dear God of the bent trees of Fifth Avenue, only pour my willful dust up your veins and I'll pound through your belly flat worlds in praise of small agonies. Suck sea monsters off Tierra del Fuego. Fuck your only begotten cobalt dream to filter golden pleasure through your apple glutted heaven filter through the uncircumcised sin of my heart. Wow. Wow. It's one of my favorite <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Wow. That, wow. That, wow. No, I'm oh, glad you like it. It was one of the early poems of hers that when I read it, my reaction was similar to yours. I was, it wasn't the first poem <laughs> of hers I read, but it was like the second or third. And I was like, right. wow, oh my God, this is great. great wow. Song. But you know what's crazy? Because you like, like I, I, I'm thinking about how people write poetry today. I'm like, wow, but if really think about it, it hasn't really changed at all in a way where it's like, wait, people still talk like this even to, from that time, even to this very day. And yet again, it goes back to the overlooking part that it's just like, oh man, like how do people miss that, you know? I think you're right. That's right on it. It gets to that overlooked part, like you said, like when... When I was when I was first putting the book together, you know, I was living with these poems for for years, and I, you know, I didn't want to get stuck in my own head. I loved the poems, and they sounded really contemporary to me. They sounded like they were written now rather than 1959, 1960. So I was I was um, sending some of the poems. Out. Oh, I saw a question I want to answer in just a second from the from the chats, but. Uh, I um okay. I was showing some of the poems to a lot of contemporary poets from today, and I was like, "What do you think of these?" And they and they the, almost universally they said, um, uh, "This this sounded like a poet from the 21st century, not from the 1950s and 1960s." And I felt so wow. good because that that's how I was reading her too. 
Um, but uh, I saw a question in the in the chats. Um, yeah. Someone asked, um, "Is the book out?" Um, yes and no. <laughs> I mean, yes. It's uh, it's a bit. This is what the cover looks like, and it's um, it's out through um, Asada Press. I'll spell it. It's A H S A H T A. So it's there, and you can find it used on Amazon, used on ABE Books. I think you can find it used on Bookshop. Um, the, the bummer, the problem is um, just this year, Asada Press, the book was published in 2014. The poems were written in 1959 and 1960, but the book was published in 2014. And what's a real bummer is um, Asada is, um, was funded by Boise State University in Idaho. And like a lot of universities, uh, uh, Boise, oh, also book depositories, another place to buy it too. Um, Boise State has been defunding a lot of their arts initiatives. And what's really a bummer is they, they defunded Asada Press. So right now, um, the book is officially as of six months ago, it's officially out of print. You can get it used though. And a lot of libraries carry it. And I'm working on getting another publisher for a second edition. And so fingers crossed within, within a year or so, there'll be a second edition with a new introduction and her poems will be out there again. There's just, sadly right now, they're only, it's only used, but hopefully really soon uh, there'll be a new edition. All right, no, that, that's good to know. Yeah, because when I try to look for it, but oh, yeah. I know it's expensive too. Yeah, I know, I know. It's, it's like hundreds of dollars for that because it's so rare print now because of what you just said. Yeah. Um, just a real quick, I want to tell, yeah, guys, um, if you have the latest, Instagram update, there's a question box on the bottom of the screen next to the comments. If you have any questions you want to ask him, definitely use that um, use that feature, but you have to have the latest update of Instagram, guys. Just keep that in mind, because I know a lot of people had problems when I had another guest there um, a couple of weeks ago, so it was just mm. a weirdness. So I had to stress the whole update to Instagram thing. All right, so, um, all right, so the next poet I'm actually going to read now from the community, she goes by evening underscore poetry. Uh, I believe she is in the room. I'm I sorry, no, no, it's, un, it's, yeah, it's evening poetry. I'm sorry, not underscore. Sorry, I'm thinking about somebody else. It's evening poetry is the poet that um, I'm going to be reading next. And there's also no title for this piece as well. So, um, yeah, so I'm going to read this now. So, all right. <clears throat> Four thin strips upon her leg. The world was never meant for her. Four thin strips of pure crimson marking down all the things too big to ever be said. She was here and now she has left. Sadness twirling in her tresses while brokenness hovers like flies. Because the scars she's been so good at hiding. Well, they're beginning to show now. And there's no victory in that. She is through Painting alcazars in the sky, fingertips trailing down slowly, down the window, while changing suits of poignancies, caught glimpses in the reflection, fitting properly, perfectly. Exhibiting bruises like badges, life measured in losses, another brutal beating, another holocaust, another lie, tacked to the wall, leaving her stripped, just blood and sinew. Who knew that shadows took up so much space. Who knew that even darkness wore a pretty smiling mask? So they came to cut her up, to poke, to prod, to hear which sound came from which wound to watch. Graveyards dance in her eyes. The satin magnolias fall again in the dusk of August shell shock, a life of daybreak, gargling rivers from the dew drops of aged honey suckled whiskey and the metal where railway spine scream bread idol is where she dwells, where she dances like China and runs like tea as cherry floret grows onto the curvature of her spine. Some call it heaven. She calls it pennies and nickels because isn't that what we're saving for? And she is gone. Leaving a trail of mangled butterfly wings and cut off clippings of paper dreams. And no, she won't ever go back. Instead, she wastes her time pulling out maps, tracing fingers overblown and, I'm sorry, over brown and yellow dots and plots of land, trying to see 
where the great desert inside her begins. And that is by Evening Poetry, and she goes by Eve. Wow, thanks, Eve. That was the, the, the way the, uh, boy, the, the, uh, the way the body just goes through so much in that poem, it's really powerful. Yeah, yeah. All right. No, I definitely agree with that. Um, I'm just looking at so quick. So, all right. So, um, so earlier I was talking about how Elise Cohen remained in love with him, with um, Allen Ginsberg, even for the rest of her life. So what was it about Allen Ginsberg that attracted her the most about him? Like, was it his presence? Was it how he spoke? Was it his intelligence? Was it the passion that he had to prove the point and to create the change through the literary, literary works? Uh, like, what, what was it? You know, because again, I remember early saying that she went as far as trying to impress him by developing the same sex relationship of her own too, you know? So I wonder what was it about him? You know, yeah, I think um, probably my, my sense of it, someone else might have a different response, but my sense of it, I think was um, his intelligence and um, his, um, his, you know, he, he, can, he can write like, you know, if, if you know a poem like Howl is a very justifiably angry poem. And, and a lot of times people know Ginsburg through the anger, the really righteous, you know, necessary political anger, like we're talking about with the demonstrations this weekend, like people are pissed off for very good reason. And Howl is one of those poems where you think this poet is really angry for good reason. But if you look at his whole body of work, he was also a really tender poet with a really um, just sweet, tender way of trying to draw people together and reach to the heart in his poems. And I think that's part of what attracted her to him, that he had this enormous intelligence, enormous curiosity, and a really big heart. Um, and I think also the other thing that attracted her to him is that he was one of those people, we all know folks like this who are just, they're an agent of change. They just draw people to them and they, they, they connect other people. And when something major is changing in the world, they're like at the center of gravity for it. Wow. And I think she was drawn to that in him. It was a, um, a real, he was a kindred spirit in that way for her. Again, even though, like we said, you know, he would, he would look past her because she was, she was a woman. Um, you know, it was, it, was, it was still the kind of community that would give her more space than a lot of other communities would, even though mm. it wasn't giving her the space she needed for sure. Wow. So you could so it's safe to say that because of this, um, she basically um, she suffered with um, what you call like not, I'm sorry, not su suffered. She she struggled with low self esteem then because you know sometimes when something like that happens, you develop low self esteem, and sometimes putting yourself out there or speaking up sometimes becomes difficult because especially when you respect someone like let's say Allen Ginsberg so much, you don't want to tarnish the friendship that means so much to you and then with that being said too you know so i wonder with that being said what i wonder was she also in denial of the fact that okay this is what's really going on or do you think she was still hopeful okay maybe maybe he'll won't neglect me as much like what do you what's your intake on that yeah that's a really good question um i think um i think um you know to be to be as well you know yeah to be as, as concise uh, as possible, because I could go on and on about this, to be as concise as possible, I think that she, um, it was just one of those situations we've all experienced in our lives where I think she, she, um, she fell in love with him, fell deeply in love with him. And I think, I think he loved her, but not, not, not with the same passion that she had for him. And sometimes when you're in that situation, you know, okay, I better just walk away. And sometimes bye, you're in that situation bye. and you think, well, maybe if I give it a little bit longer, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll match up. And, um, right. and so that's just a normal, like I see that as a normal human response. What's really sad is a lot of critics and scholars and historians of the beat era, you know, the ones who wrote about Allen Ginsberg and wrote about Elise Cowan, they would portray her as kind of like um, only focusing on the fact that she developed schizophrenia, paranoid schizophrenia, as best you can tell from the diagnosis, the diagnoses I know are kind of fluid, but um, um, 
people would focus on that and they would think, oh, well, she must have been mentally ill and she was a stalker. She was portrayed as if she was Ginsburg's stalker. Right. And, and I don't think she was a stalker at all. I think she was- No, nah, I don't like, think so either. How many times have we all done that? You're in love with someone, they don't love you in the same way, but you're not willing to give up, but you're not stalking them. And- uh, Right. I, and she was, and she loved him and she wanted to be friends with him. And they, you know, they maintained and cultivated a friendship. And had she lived to um, an older age, I think they would have been even deeper platonic friends, probably. Right. No, I definitely agree with that. Definitely, definitely. All right. So, um, you know, because I'm just checking on the time of the clock. Oh. All right, we still have time. Yeah, right. as far as the first hour, then Robin jumped in the second hour. Okay, so, that's right. Uh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so I want to make sure as well I'm, I'm getting through the pieces as well. Because <laughs> it's just so exciting. I'm like, oh, I want to keep on going, you know. But um, no, so if you want to read another piece of hers. Yeah, sure. Know, <laughs> how about um, how about if I read a little longer poem? Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, that should be fine. And it's not really, it's not like, uh, it's not like uh, a book or anything. It's just like a couple pages. I want to find the page number. Okay. Like, uh, like I said, one of the, I was trying to, one of the things I was doing when I was organizing the book is I was trying to find like themes and patterns and organize it by themes and patterns. And one of the themes was um, poems that were in, inspired, of course, by beat writers. She was inspired by the beat generation. I could read one of those later maybe, but right now I wanted to read a poem. One of her most foremost, like strongest influences was Emily Dickinson. Okay. And, uh, this is a poem called, I Took the Skins of Corpses. And it's a mashup of the style that Emily Dickinson used, these four line stanzas with a ballad kind of, a bouncy ballad kind of rhythm. And, um, uh, but also mashing it up with the Mary Shelley's Frankenstein story. Um, okay. And there's a real fierce kind of feminist through line in this poem, I think that like, you got Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, but then Mary Shelley's mother wrote a vindication of the rights of women. And then M Emily Dickinson had a fierce feminist sensibility that it took critics a long time to really notice. So it's kind of all of that in one. And uh, it's one of my oh. favorite poems of hers. Um, so it's called, I Took the Skins of Corpses. I took the skins of corpses and dyed them blue for dreams. Oh, I can wear these everywhere. I sat home in my jeans. I cut the hair of corpses and wove myself a sheath finer than silk or wool, I thought, and shivered underneath. I cut the ears of corpses to make myself a hood warmer than forget-me-nots. I paid for that in blood. I robbed the eyes of corpses so I could face the sun but all the days had cloudy skies and I had lost my own. From the sex of corpses, I sewed a union suit. Esther, Solomon, God himself were humbler than my cooch. I took the thoughts of corpses to buy my daily needs, but all the goods in all the stores were neatly labeled me. I borrowed heads of corpses to do my reading by. I found my name on every page and every word a lie. A machine from bones of corpses would play upon my human love. The only sound the keys would make were hissings of a dove. I dug among the endless graves. I thought my time well filled. The mirror giggles when I look. I'm bald and blind and quilled. I thought the corpse is vital that the risk involved ensured the stuff that I had taken be precious marble pure. But when tempted by a heart, replacing it with small jewels, I found it bloodied as a mind and mine become a ghoul's. Now, when I meet the spirits in whose trappings I am jailed, they buy me wine or read a book. No one can make my bail. When I become a spirit, I'll have to wait for life. I'll sell my deadly body to the student doctor's knife. Wow. <laughs> oh my God, wow. It's one of my favorites of hers and she she revised, it was the one poem in her notebook 
that she revised more than any other. So I think it was a poem that was really important to her. So it feels, wow. feels good to be able to read it. <laughs> yeah. Wow. You know, so there's a there's a poet on this community called Dreadful Artist, and she actually writes like that. That's so, oh my God. Oh, that's, that's exactly great. what I was thinking about. And um, wow. I, I love the imagery in that piece. Like, that is, wow. And it's just interesting, again, like, I can't believe people actually wrote like that back then. Because I thought that style was like something recent, like, you know, like like early 90s. and stuff. Like, yeah. I thought that was all new, but no. And one thing I thought about was probably like Marilyn Manson, because you know, if you look at his music, he'll that certainly sounds like something he would write, but yeah. in music. So it's so interesting. Like, oh man, like no, that goes that style was way before that. But was really that like, like that. forbidden? Was that forbidden um type of style of writing back in that time? I think, you know, it's 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 I think if you were a guy, anything goes. And, and, and you know, in the in this was like in the late 50s and early 60s, if you were a guy anything goes in terms of subject matter and form. But I think as a woman, I think the anger and um, just the, the pissed off person that's in the middle of that poem, the speaker, the pissed off narrator, I think that kind of anger was, if not forbidden in women, I just, I think like mainstream critics just didn't want to touch it. They were just like, no, nope, not going to do it. Um, right, they could right. touch it from a man, that'd be cool, but not from a woman. And that's part of what wow, I so like about the poem is she's like, I'm going to write it anyway. Yeah. Wow. No, that's amazing. That's a, <laughs> no, thank you for sharing that piece. All right. So the next piece I'm going to read, it is um, his username. Um, I hope I pronounce it Reservoir. Summers, that's the that's the username on here, but he goes by Sam Thomas and it's called Cup Glass. That's the name of the piece. Pill to tongue, little white absolute cure, silence, 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 phone won't stop. Shut the fuck up. Hands drenched and shaking, almost as much vodka on the floor as there's in my cup, glass. That could work too. Why even bother cleaning up? Someone else would have to. How many are even in here? Never mind. I'm not tired yet. Phone lights up. Buzz, buzz, buzz. Not enough. Names on the screen, whatever. They'll all be fine. Another. Pill to tongue. Another one. Go to sleep, Sam. Text, call, text, call, buzz, buzz. Stop. Her. That fucking name. Do what you gotta do, just to spite her. Finger to tongue, I have some calls to make. And that is by Sam Thomas, that piece. Oh, that was great, thanks Sam. Uh, uh, I was just, I wanted to write <laughs> down that last line, I have some calls to make, yeah. <laughs> I really like the like, wow. text, text, call, buzz, I have some calls yes. to make, the technology that's just sort of like raining in on you in the poem, yeah, yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. He's, I just started to get to know that person actually. And I, as I read his pieces, I'm like, wow. So when he had, um, I saw this piece, I was like, oh my God, I have to read this piece. This was such a, oh my God, piece. All right. Um, I'm actually going to read another piece only because I just saw, we have 10 minutes left and I want to make sure I get to everybody's piece. And then we could, I guess, just finish the rest of the conversation. Just, you know, talking about more about Lise Cohen and stuff like that. Sure. So the next piece is from Sandra. So she goes by S. Rudik Dar. That's her username. And she goes by Sandra. Everybody. She also does lives with the first poet I read, Brian Edwards. These two together, when they go live, it, it's just always fun. And it's always just lifting everybody up. Just like like you said about Alan Ginsberg, always just lifting up everybody, you know? And that's I think that's definitely important, you know? All right, so, presumptions of you, thinking. Thinking I want you always on top, in control. No, let me take the rein. Let me, let me be your top ecstasy as I hold you down, as I am the one to pin you. Let me be the one to pin you. Arms above your head, me gliding, rocking, riding, until you say, is it my turn? I smile slightly, releasing your arms, not removing the hold my body has on you. Legs slowly move. I spin carefully on top, rising just enough. Ass 
now facing you just like how you like just how you like it gently teasing my wet drip i'm all yours i say as you grab my ads tightly grantly I'm, I'm sorry gently boldly i move in rhythm i move you move as we fall out of control uh what just happened i'm sorry out of control and give in to the moment and that is by sandra Oh, that's and great. This Thanks, piece, I'll tell you why this piece caught my eye. I, and when I, I literally saw Allen Ginsberg and uh, Elise Cohen together, I'm going to tell you why. Because I wonder if, like, was this the kind of, you know, sometimes there's just some things you just can't talk about with somebody because unfortunately due to the circumstances, it's just kind of hard to just really talk about. So I wonder it's like I think she went into to Elise Cohen's head and say this is this is what she probably would feel like if she was like, but she couldn't tell Alan this. So this is what she felt inside. That's the way I took this piece, and this piece really blew my mind when I read this. Mm. Yeah, you know, I, I it's a good question. Thinking like, what would if she, uh, uh, what was it she really wanted to tell? Ginsburg, but didn't, because you're right, there's always something, you know, the one thing you just can't tell, that secret thing in the back of your mind. Yes. I, and I don't know what that would be, except, you know, um, I mean, I'm thinking of that poem by Sandra, the way that traditional top and bottom male and female roles get turned around, and, and yeah. she's like, you know, let, let me be your top, let me be the one to pin you down, and, and, yes. and I really like the force in that, and um I don't know if Elise would have wanted to tell him that maybe, but I know that that was that kind of gender fluidity, the fluidity of traditional gender positions that it really appealed to her. So I think, I think she would find a resonance in that poem for sure. Yeah. Yes. Oh my God. That that's whew, man. Again, I'm just excited to even talk about all of this. Um, oh yeah. Uh, yeah. No. So do you have another piece you want to read from you know, Elise Cohen? Yeah. It's really funny. Cause I, I, I had a couple choices, you know, I had some notes, like which one should I read? And then when you were reading Sandra's poem right now about shifting gender positions, it got me thinking of one particular poem of hers. And also one thing about her life that I didn't mention, and I, I'm surprised I didn't get to it just because we were going on to other things, you know, but right. um, one of the things that makes her so mysterious and makes her history so mysterious is that, you know, she was a, like so many writers, she was an obsessive writer. She kept journals, she filled notebooks with poems. Um, but her, when she died, she committed suicide in mm, 1962. Yeah. And when she died, her parents found her notebooks and they were mortified. They were outraged because in her poems, you know, she's part of the beat generation. So she's talking about drug experimentation, but she was also talking about um, what we would call today, you know, gender fluidity or um, bisexuality or pansexuality. I mean, she, she didn't identify as, you know, in a, she didn't identify in any kind of heteronormative way possible. And she, you know, like in the 21st century, we, we know that there, there are more than two genders. And, uh, but for someone like Elise Cowan, she was stuck in this world that you had to be male or female. You had to be- yeah. You had to be straight, and if you were gay or bi, those were you know you had to keep that secret. It was it was it was actually considered treasonous in the McCarthy era. So what her parents did, her her parents were so upset by the sexual references and the the fluid um, heterosexual and lesbian material in the poems that the, the her parents' neighbors burned all the journals as a favor to the parents, and this book wouldn't exist except for one of her friends, Leo Skur, oh, saved yeah. one notebook. <laughs> and so this is oh. it's a very short poem, but it kind of gets at that issue of gender fluidity, I think. And it's a, yes. I also think it's a beautiful poem. Uh, it's called Someone I Could Kiss. Okay. Someone I Could Kiss has left his, her tracks. A memory heavy as winter breathing in the snow and with weight and heat of human body. Wow. <laughs> oh, that's very, very embodied wow. poem with, with many yes. different bodies. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Wow. No, I love that. And I, again, like 
I, I think this was perfect the way, like the, because I had a certain order originally when I was to read the poems, but I think the order I read it today was perfect and it, it aligns with all that. And it, it works really, really organically. I think. Yeah. Yes. And um, I gotta say, so I was gonna, and that's funny because now my next, my last question I was gonna ask, because yeah. I have one more piece, which is my piece, but it's okay. It's oh, we can hear your piece too. Yeah, I'll, I'll, no. make a, I'll give you a quick answer. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, because I only have three minutes left anyway, so it, it's fine. Okay, um, okay. So my question was, it was about Leo's skirt. So basically my question was, well, what, what my first question was, was that the only notebook that he had that exists? And how important was Leo Skirt to Elise Cohen as far as her works? Because that has to have been very important, because if it wasn't for Leo Skirt, who, we probably would have never heard of her, right? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, Elise, the fact that Elise Cowan has a readership now, she has readers, she has an audience, um, you know, this book helped that, but this book wouldn't exist without Leo Skirt. So you know, she has an audience because of Leo. Um, and that was sadly the only notebook, as far as we know, it was the only notebook. It was because it was saved only because she had been temporarily, she had been staying with a friend of hers, uh, in New York, Irving Rosenthal. And she, she left the notebook in Irving's apartment by mistake. And Leo found wow. it after her death. And Leo recognized, oh my God, I have to keep this. And if her, if, if Leo, if Elisa's parents find out, they might try to destroy it. So he hung on to wow. it. Um, so Leo, to answer the other part of your question, it was very important to Elise. The weird thing is, like, like I said, like these poems wouldn't exist if it wasn't for Leo. What's also sad, though, is that he had a kind of ownership sensibility about her work after a while, a kind of proprietary sense, so that um, he, he, got, he got a number of her poems published after her death in individual journals. And he often talked about, well, I've got a collection of her poems. I'll try to get them published. But he never really tried very hard. <laughs> so he, oh, kinda, wow. he would hold on to them. He had a kind of tight ownership of them, but he really didn't own the poems. They were owned, um, you know, by Elise's heirs, you know, and uh, wow. those were the okay. people I worked with on the book. So, so on the one hand, you know, thank you, Leo Skurb. We wouldn't have these poems if it wasn't for him. But he also held on to them a long time, and I really wish – he right. would have published them 30 or 40 years ago and we would have known right, them longer. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I have a couple of seconds left on this clock, but Tony, uh, I'm going to hand it over to Robin and thank you so much for joining me and, and joining us for doing this live. Um, so Robin, we'll see you in the second hour. Thank you so much for doing this and thank you for everything you have done for Leeds Cohen and to the Beats Generation community. So um, God bless you, and um, I'm going to hand it over to Robin now in the next hour. God bless you. Thank you so All much. Right. Thanks, Andy. It was really great.